Hi, everyone. Welcome to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My name is Samantha Shokin, manager of public programs, and today we are joined by award-winning writer and editor Dan Okrent for a conversation about his new book, The Guarded Gate, Bigotry, Eugenics, and the Law That Kept Two Generations of Jews, Italians, and other European immigrants out of America. Interviewing Dan today is Museum of Jewish Heritage CEO and President Jack Lieger, who is himself an immigrant. Uh, Jack was born in Florence, Italy, to Polish and Hungarian Holocaust survivors before emigrating with his family to Brooklyn at three years old. Prior to his work at the museum, Jack had a long, a long career in media, holding executive leadership posts at a wide variety of media outlets, including GQ, Glamour, Condé Nast Publications, and Hatchet Filipacci Media. Jack's accomplished career has been recognized with Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Magazine Publishers of America and the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, and he has leveraged his success in support of the causes and institutions to which he is most passionately committed. He served for more than a decade on the Museum of Jewish Heritage's Board of Trustee before becoming President and CEO of the museum last year. So before I turn it over to Jack and Dan, I wanted to just go over a few quick uh, housekeeping notes. Um, those of you who have joined for, for many of our programs sort of know the drill by now. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the program. Um, and please submit your questions to Jen and Jack, Dan and Jack, sorry, uh, into the chat box and into the Q&A form. Uh, and we'll, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can at the end of the program. And this session is being recorded, so don't worry if some of your friends are missing out or unable to join us. Um, it'll be recorded and uploaded to YouTube in the coming days. So on that note, I will now turn it over to Jack, who will introduce our special guest, Dan Oprint. Well, thank you, Samantha. Um, and uh, thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. I, uh, I, um, I don't often hear that description, so it was very, uh, very interesting to hear. Thank you, you did that very well. Um, so, um, it is a great pleasure for me to be able to do an interview with a longtime colleague and I believe a longtime friend from the publishing industry, Daniel Okrent, who has had an illustrious career as an author, playwright, a journalist. And throughout that career, he's always remained to me the most important thing a real mensch. Dan was the public editor of the New York Times. He spent more than a decade at Time Inc., where among a number of distinguished positions he held, he was the managing editor of Life Magazine. Dan co-founded New England Monthly Magazine, which was the winner of two National Magazine Awards for general excellence. Dan is also the co-author and co-producer of the off-Broadway hit, Old Jews Telling Jokes. In the field of book publishing, Dan was an editor at Knopf and at Viking Press, and he was an editor-in-chief at Harcourt Brace and is himself the author of six books. And one of his books is what we'll be talking about with, today, with Dan about today. It's his most recent book. As Samantha said, The Guard of Gate, story of bigotry, eugenics, and the laws that kept two generations of Jews, Italians, and other European immigrants out of America. And I'd like to add that this book, The Guard Gate, was just named the winner of the 2019 National Jewish Book Award for History. Dan currently lives in Cape Cod with his wife, poet Rebecca Okrent. They have two adult children who, as Dan has described, are wonderful, but don't call them nearly as often as they should. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Okrent. Thank you, Jack. Pleasure to be here. Great. So let's get right into it, Dan. Um, I must say that you've written books about various subjects, like baseball, a great book about the prohibition, and a book about the history of Rockefeller Center. So what made you write a book about immigration and racism? Well, I had no idea, Jack, when I set out to write it, that it was about either of those things. I found myself in a conversation in Havana, of all places, with an old friend who had grown up in Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island, 
and she was talking about how the laboratory there, the very distinguished Cold Spring Harbor Lab, which has produced eight Nobel Prize winners, right. uh, was also the place where eugenics came to America. And she said the word eugenics. I thought, wow, that's interesting. I, I need, I want to learn more about that. And I thought I'd find a book that I could write about eugenics. And as I got into it, further into it, I saw this one angle of the story, which was how, if you'll excuse the expression, the bullshit science of eugenics was used to keep, as the subtitle says, Jews, Italians, uh, and other Eastern and Southern Europeans out of the country for, from 1924 until 1965. And being the son of immigrants, uh, well, it's, uh, grandson on one side, son on the other side, um, it struck me, uh, this is something that we need to pay attention to. And it was also, uh, of course, an issue that was beginning to bubble up into the, the uh, current political um, scene. So what year was as, as that you, you had that first conversation in Havana, Dan? That was in 2013. And then I finally settled on this as a subject in 2014. That's when I began working on it. It was about four and a half years of research. And the research is always fascinating. And so those were happy moments. Writing it is much harder. Yeah. So this was before the election of 2016 when it... Yes, it was. Um, so, uh, as I said, it was beginning to be an issue uh, uh, on a large scale. Um, I have never been luckier to be a year and a half late delivering my book, because by the time I did deliver it to my publisher, it was a front page story. The question of immigration, who, who comes, who, who is an American, who are Americans? Mm -hmm. That's really what my book is about. Uh, just that it is about a different generation and yeah. people not from Latin America or from Muslim countries, but from Eastern and Southern Europe. So Dan, um, I mean, broadly, what you just said uh, is, is, a, is a, a very key point, and that's that the theme of the book sort of is then and now. And what you did was you connected the rise of eugenics with the uh, anti-immigration movement in America and then its adoption by Nazism and the impact these movements had on immigration to the U.S. from the 20s through the 60s. But it, it really, the, the interesting thing you said about eugenics is that most people don't even understand. I mean, the, it, many people think it's some, you know, muscle empowerment thing. <laughs> but could you describe eugenics and how it sort of empowered and, and, and and pushed forward the anti-immigration movement in this country? Sure, uh, the short version. Uh, eugenics was something that pops up in the post-Darwin, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the yeah. bubbling uh, 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 of, of scientific, new scientific ideas in the wake of Darwin. And in fact, the word eugenics and the, and, and the idea was put forward by a cousin, first cousin of Darwin's named Francis Galton, who was very, wealthy gentleman scientist in England who liked to count things. And he found himself counting uh, the people who were uh, uh, in books of well, the, the equivalent of who's who, who were the well-known people in Britain. And he would put these columns of numbers together and he came to the conclusion that hmm, people who are successful have successful children and people who are musical have musical children. Now he doesn't bother to think about the way that they were raised at all. He attributes it to a science that he sort of events. Eugenics means good birth. Um, and it was an idea that really had to do with matching individuals. And he, he put forward, you know, one of his more famous ideas at the time in the 1880s was that Britain needed to find the eugenically the, uh, the, the, the soundest, uh, the best, the brightest uh, young people and put them in arranged marriages. Uh, 3,000 couples would get married in Westminster Abbey, presided over by Queen Victoria, and then they would be given an annual stipend so they could produce good babies for the benefit of Britain. Well, that idea crosses the ocean uh, in a very different form around uh, 1901, 1902 to Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and I'll get back to that. But in the, in the meantime, as the immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe accelerated in the 1890s, uh, Ellis Island opens in 1892. Um, by 1900, there are hundreds of thousands of Italian immigrants near and, and of Jewish immigrants particular, and particularly uh, and there, there arises this intense anti-immigrant movement, really not that dissimilar from the one we see today, although the people who led it were 
among the finest, you know, the leading uh, uh, aristocratic uh, political and literary figures of, of the period. Um, and and they was considered are, progressive politically. Many of them were progressive uh, politically. Theodore Roosevelt, who's, uh, you know, who's, who's made the news recently for being a, 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 an unfortunate statue, uh, would be an example. Uh, the first, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was one of the great leaders of bringing the vote to, to, to uh, uh, trying to bring the vote to black people in, 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 in the South. Uh, he was really the key figure, uh, particularly among the upper classes of New York and Boston um, and Philadelphia to, to, to a degree, the, the Episcopalian largely or Unitarian upper classes. It would have been strange to find people who were not anti-immigrant and particularly who were not anti-Semitic. It was almost as if it were mother's milk. And, and the way I can best illustrate this is the story of a young woman of extremely fine birth, uh, from very, very good family, uh, good education, who actually works in the settlement houses on the Lower East Side of New York in the early part of the century. And around 1918, 1919, she's in her early thirties. And she writes a letter to her mother-in-law and says that she never wants to go to another Jew party. She had been to one the night before, where all they talk about is money and sables and diamonds. And she meets, a professor at the Harvard Law School, as it happens to be Franklin Felix Frankfurter, says he was a very intelligent man, but very Jew. And the author of these letters was Eleanor Roosevelt. And so if you think that Eleanor Roosevelt, who is the model of tolerance, I think uh, you know, this, this great beacon of tolerance, certainly for our generation and, and, and many others, if even she was infected with this sort of uh, disease, I, that's the only thing I can call it, it gives you an idea of the environment. In any case, Lodge leads the, the movement to pass laws to keep people from Eastern and Southern Europe out, out of the country. And the law that he proposes and is first passed in 1896 is vetoed by uh, President Grover Cleveland in the last month um, of, his, uh, of his second term. Um, the law is passed again in 1912. Lodge is still leading it. And it's vetoed by William Howard Taft at the end of his term. Um, it's passed again in 1914 and Woodrow Wilson vetoes it. And he vetoes it a second time in 1917. But by 1917, the tide had turned. And this is where eugenics comes back into the story. As I mentioned, eugenics as conceived by Galton was about individuals choosing mates on the basis of uh, presumed genetic superiority. But there was a man named, named Madison Grant who was a, a, a progressive figure of his time. Uh, he was the founder of the Bronx Zoo. He was the uh, man, he was America's leading conservationist. He's the man who sing, almost single-handedly saved the redwood forests. He was a terrible anti-Semite. And he publishes a book in 1916 called The Passing of the Great Race, where he takes this eugenic idea and applies it not to individuals, but to racial and ethnic groups. And he divides Europe into three groups. The Nordics, who are tall and blonde and brave, and we owe most of civilization's progress to them. The, uh, uh, um, uh, the Alpines, who are solid artisans and are necessary for the function of society. And then at the bottom of the ladder, the Mediterraneans. Uh, the Mediterraneans were meant to be serfs and, and, and virtually slaves. And he writes at one point, he says, we know from science, and this is the important point, science, or what was presumed to be science then, we know from science that the marriage between any two genetic types will revert to the lower type. Therefore, a marriage between a Nordic and an Alpine produces an Alpine, and a marriage between an Alpine and a Mediterranean produces a Mediterranean, and the marriage between any of the three European races and a Jew will yield a Jew. And this book is then embraced by the anti-immigration movement and says, see, it's not that we're racist or anti-Semitic or anti-Italian. It's science tells us that this must be the way we can keep America great, to use a term, uh, by keeping it pure. Yeah. So, so eugenics had really come into its own, started in England, you said, and brought over the U.S. But at the same time, there was this distinct anti-immigration movement, the Immigration Restriction League, and that was where Lodge came in. And the, it was the unholy marriage of the two that created the sort of um, push to pass restrictive laws. One without the other didn't seem to be 
powerful enough. But it well, was the, you know, the anti-immigration movement, Jack, was powerful, but but it was there. Three presidents used their veto four times to veto it, and they would not have done that if they were truly terrified of the political consequences. But mm -hmm. once Lodge and company had this so-called scientific argument on, the, on their side, and once we had uh, well-known uh, faculty members at Princeton, at Harvard, at Stanford, uh, at the University of Michigan, the University of Chicago, putting forth these eugenic ideas, embracing them and endorsing them, it became impossible to dismiss the anti-immigrant feelings that uh, Lodge and company had, because as I said, they, they, it had been reified, something that was truly prejudicial, right. truly based on, on bias, uh, was cleaned up under the mantle of science. But what came out of it was a sort of validation of racist um, feeling. I mean, in reading the book, I was amazed at the open statements of racism that were so prevalent in, the, in both movements. Well, you know, it, it, it's, that, that's been a factor in American life, the anti-immigration kind of racism, since the colonial period. In 1753, I believe it was, a, uh, a, a newspaper editor in Philadelphia published a tract in which he made the case that the Germans who were immigrating to, to Pennsylvania should be kept out because they, you know, they were ruining our language and they were ruining uh, the, the life we have in this city. And that was Benjamin Franklin who wrote that. Mm -hmm. And this feeling of uh, anti-immigrant, uh, this fear of the other, it rises and rises and rises throughout American history. Uh, of course, the Irish in 1840, at the time of the, of the potato family, they were seen as, as the, the deficient other. Uh, in 1872, 1882, uh, the first really restrictive immigration act in American history was the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, which really fundamentally left all Asians uh, on the wrong side of, of uh, the immigration line, or they, they couldn't even get in line. The Kosovo immigration from China and Japan and other parts of Asia for more than half a century. So there was very much in the American brain for this to be turned to the new immigrants who were pouring into the big cities of the, of the East Coast, uh, primarily the new immigrants who were coming from largely from Italy, Poland, and Russia. So, so um, at, at the museum, we obviously teach the history of Nazism and, and, and the, the anti-Semitism that was so prevalent and the Holocaust that emerged. Um, but it seems from what I read and what you're saying that Nazism actually, their racist worldview was very uh, connected and inspired by uh, the American eugenicists. Uh, were there direct connections between German and American eugenicists? And yes, West? and I have to say the connections that existed between primarily Charles Davenport, the leading American eugenicist who was at Cold Spring Harbor, between uh, Davenport and certain of his colleagues at Stanford and at Princeton and the German eugenicists of the same period, there was no mention of race at all. It had nothing to do with the German master race. It had nothing to do with the inferiority of Jews. It was strictly on this individual idea of, of genetics that had been transformed into eugenics. But they were very much in touch with each other from the early 1900s up until 1929, 1930. Uh, at the same time, when the immigration law of 1924, which I'm sure we'll get to and discuss in some detail, the one that fundamentally kept Jews and Italians out of the country, um, after it was passed, uh, young Adolf Hitler in Landsberg prison outside of Munich, uh, he is writing Mein Kampf, and he acknowledges that he has read Madison Grant's book, and in Mein Kampf, Hitler, this is 1924, says specifically that the U.S. is the only country that has learned how to deal with immigrants. Right. Their way of dealing with immigrants was to keep them out of the country. So you have this connection to what became the Nazi horror, coming both on the scientific side and on, on the, the, the side of pure prejudice. Right. And, Once and, you, and the, third, the third leg on that stool was that they had actually passed legislation. The first uh, emergency anti-immigrant law was in 21, and then it became permanent later. But that part of it, the, 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 the movement to make it, to, to codify uh, the, the suppositions against immigration and 
supported by the eugenicists. Can you talk a little about how the political impact of that was felt? Yeah. Well, the 1924 law, um, which passes uh, without any problem at all, um, got its first real boost, um, one could say, from an article that appeared in all places, Good Housekeeping magazine, in 1922, um, which it made the case that now that science has proven that these people are inferior, we must keep them out of the country. And the author of that article was Calvin Coolidge, who had just been sworn in as vice president. By 1924, he is president, and he is very much anti-immigrant, uh, and particularly anti-immigrant uh, uh, from Eastern and Southern uh, Europe. Uh, it was a train that could not be stopped. And the law that is passed in 1924 and, and remained in place until 1965 was among the most brilliantly diabolical or diabolically uh, brilliant pieces of legislation imaginable. Because nowhere in the law does it mention any of the words Italian, Catholic, Jew, Poland, Russia, Greece. There is no mention of any race, any religion, any ethnicity at all. Instead, they came up with a formula. And the formula was that you would limit the number of people from any country coming into the U.S. in any given year to the percentage of people already in the U.S. who are of that ethnicity. So if 10% of Americans came from country A, then 10% of the new immigrants could come from country A. Um, now, you would think a bill passed in 1924, they would base this on the 1920 census, uh, not yet five years old. But no, they didn't do that, or the 1910 census, or the 1900 census, they based it on the 1890 census. They went back 34 years to Why define they... the America that they wanted. Uh, In other words, before the big immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe began. Well, wasn't this something that people said was, was just uh, bogus, fake? I mean, you're going, they went back 30 years? Or... The, 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 the political drift uh, by that time uh, had gone entirely over to the anti-immigrant side. Uh, the end of World War I had brought another big wave of immigrants in. Um, there, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the radical movements of the late, of the, of the 1900s, uh, 1910s, 1920, uh, many, many of the leaders of those movements were Jews and Italians. Uh, the, the anti, uh, the Red Raids of 1920 were directed at them. So, it was easy to demonize Jews and Italians uh, at that point. So this passed with great ease. What, one of the things that I found very distressing in doing the research is that even some people who opposed the bill kind of fell into the same trap. The, the most vocal opponent of the bill in Congress was Fiorello LaGuardia, himself half Italian, half Jewish, spoke Yiddish, um, and uh, the, he was the tribune of the, of the, common, of the common people. And he gave a, a, a brilliant speech attacking the, the racism and the ethnic and religious discrimination that was inherent uh, in, in, in this bill. But in the middle of the speech, he pauses to say, now, I understand why we would keep Chinese and Japanese out of the country. They can't assimilate with us. Fundamentally, what he was saying is, we are white. They are not white. Uh, so there are many people that I have had rather fond feelings about historically who get a little bit soiled by this terrible story. Yeah, unfortunately, there were always, there were even divisions within the American Jewish community on this subject. There was intense anti-Eastern anti European uh, 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 feeling among the, the German Jews who had begun to arrive in, in 1848. And I think we have to qualify the term German Jews. They weren't necessarily from Germany, but they spoke German. They were not Yiddish speaking. They were from Czechoslovakia, Austria, Germany, a number of other places. They had been fully assimilated, they believed, um, by the 1890s, and they saw the arrival of a, a, another boatload of, of uh, heavily bearded, caftan-wearing, Orthodox Jews speaking, as one of them described, with a, 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 a weird gutter Yiddish. Uh, they thought this reflects badly on us. I mean, we can't be associated with these people. We have to keep them apart. You know, in New York, what is now Mount Sinai Hospital was founded as the Jews Hospital was called. Uh, and until the 1890s, it only had German Jewish uh, patients. But as these, these uh, immigrants came in, um, they wouldn't provide kosher uh, food for them. They did not have any Yiddish-speaking people on staff. This led to the creation of Beth Israel, the downtown 
Jewish hospital of the period. There was a real divide. But then Jacob Schiff, among others, mm -hmm. they wake up around 1900, the anti-immigration movement that they have kind of to tolerated, if not supported. They realize it's not their decision who's a Jew and who isn't. It's not they who can say, well, I'm different from these, these ghetto dwellers who have just come off the boat. It's the anti-Semite who decides who's a Jew that they don't like. And they realized that they had no choice but to then support the immigrants when they came here. Now, the support took many different and strange forms, but they did support them. But the, uh, the, the, the effect, no matter how much opposition there had been, even uh, among uh, um, uh, many groups, uh, when the law was passed, the effect was devastating on on uh, immigration uh, from uh, Europe and Asia to the, uh, to the right. And this is this is the truly tragic part of the story. Um, until in the last few years before the emergency law went into effect in 1921, and then the the permanent law in 1924, <clears throat> 220,000 Italians a year were coming into the country, and 95,000. Eastern European Jews on average. As a result of this quota system that was put in place, those numbers were reduced to fewer than 5,000 for each of those ethnic groups, fewer than 5,000, because it was based how many Italians and Jews were in the US already in 1890. And that law was in place from 1924 until Lyndon Johnson signed the successor law that got rid of the, the quotas in 1965. And I certainly don't need to tell you, an immigrant yourself, uh, or anybody, I think, who's, who's um, tuned in today, what the consequences of that would have been. If you think that 95,000 Jews were coming every year from Eastern Europe and then it was reduced to 5,000, what happened to the other 90,000? Mm -hmm. I think we know what happened. No matter how we reduce that number, say, well, some of them went to other countries or some of them um, probably didn't, you know, they would have found a way to, to you know, to, to, you know go elsewhere in Europe, or you know, wh whatever mitigating figure you can come up with. Um, still, it had to be tens of thousands every year who would have come to the US and were unable to come to the US, and we know what happened to them. So Dan, you're a descendant of Jewish immigrants yourself. What was it like when you were researching and, and, and writing this book? No one well, I was very grateful that my paternal grandparents got off the boat in 1911, before the quotas, uh, and similarly grateful that my mother, who was born in Romania, um, that her father had come in 1922 before the quota was fully established. And because he was here, she was able to come later because you did have this linkage through, through families that continued to be allowed. Uh, you know, among the, the, the other ethnic groups that suffered from this, one, one that particularly noteworthy were the Greeks, because the Greek immigration, there's no Greek immigration to the U.S. before 1890. It doesn't really happen until the Greek and, and Turkish wars of the early 20th century break out. Um, if you, so as a result, the quota for Greeks after 1924 was 100 people a year, 100 Greeks a year could come. So anybody I meet who's Greek, I say, I know that your parents got here sometime before 1924 because after 1924, it was virtually impossible. And was there ever a point that the, the leaders of both the eugenics and anti-immigration movement eventually saw what had, they had wrought, what they had done, or did they always believe that they were in the right? No, um, th there's a, a real division. I think that people like Madison Grant, who wrote the book I mentioned before, to his dying day, he believed in it and supported any anti-Semitic measure and was an, an acknowledged fan of Hitler's. Um, people of less public despicable views, though, many like Fairfield Osborne, who was the director of the Museum of American Museum of Natural History for 30 years, uh, he stuck by it. Uh, on the other hand, there were many who repudiated their own words. And uh, one of them, um, uh, Carl Brigham, who was a professor at, at uh, Princeton, who wrote one of the intellectual tracts that supported the idea of, of racial eugenics. Uh, he also founded the SAT, interestingly. Uh, in 1930, he, he says, I can't believe I said what I, and this is before Hitler's rise, 
he, he recognizes what he had done. Another was Edward A. Ross, uh, who was uh, a very prominent sociologist at the University of Wisconsin, a very popular writer, author of many uh, bestsellers. And he said, you know, I rue everything that I did 30 years ago. And it took him 30 years to realize it. The Rockefeller Foundation had supported eugenic research uh, in Europe and in the US in the 1920s. They and uh, the Carnegie Institute of Washington, they, they, they woke up one day and said, oh my God, look what we've done. But it took Hitler to get them to realize what they had done. One of the other uh, interesting uh, ironies here is that the publisher who had done most of the book publishing of many of these eugenicists was the, the Scribner. Um, yeah, Scribner uh, published this book, and uh, therein lies a, a, a brief story. My, my last book, uh, Last Call, which was a history of Prohib prohibition, my previous book, had been published very successfully by Scribner, Scribner in 2011. I was their author, they were my publisher, and then I decided to do this book and learned that Scribner was effectively the official publisher of the eugenics movement and of the anti-immigration movement. That all of them, following Madison Grant, almost all of the books that published the, that, that had an impact were published by Scribner. And they were nervous about whether they could proceed with it. It's not owned by the Scribner family anymore, but there are members of the Scribner family who are still associated with the firm. Uh, and the current management, you know, they were squirrely. They were, squirrely. They, they, it, it made them uncomfortable. And my agent and I met with them and said, we can take this book anywhere. I think we can find many publishers, but wouldn't, you rather publish it than have somebody else do it. And Susan Moldau, the publisher at the time, she, you, you saw the light go on over her head, that it made much more sense for them to make a clean breast of their complicit role in this horrible movement than to have somebody pointing a finger at them. So they went ahead and published it, I think, bravely and well. Well, yes, they did. And, and it was, um amazing to me in reading about how much they had been involved in publishing all the books for the eugenics movement and the anti-immigration movement and then and then realizing that they published this book as well so yeah, yeah. Irony. So, no, so the, now, the, it's you know go ahead i'm sorry jack no go ahead you, you finish no, the, 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 the story the story is is filled with ironies and and if it were not such an ugly story the ironies would be amusing uh, they mm -hmm. cease to be so given what happened. Uh, you know, I think it's worth mentioning, if I may jump ahead. Um, 1932, the emergence of Hitler, 1933, uh, Hitler has taken over the, the, the German government. The scientists that the American eugenicists had been working with are suddenly embraced by Hitler. He says, without my doctors, I would be nowhere. His doctors being the academics who put forth racial theories that he adopted. So the people who had been very distinguished uh, international genetic uh, pioneers, suddenly they, serving their own interests, of course, they embrace Nazism. Uh, one of them, uh, probably the most important of them, becomes the rector of the University of Berlin and fires all the Jews on the faculty almost immediately. Uh, another one of them, a psychiatrist, uh, uh, helps write the Nuremberg Laws and receives the Goethe Medal from Hitler in 1939. Uh, it's a terrible story. The, I'm not saying that the Nazis wouldn't have done what they did without the American eugenicists and the American uh, racists leading the way for them, but it gave them a sort, they believed, a sort of moral cover. Uh, and that was best illustrated in 1946 at the beginning of the Nuremberg trials, the first doctor's trial. One of the people who was being, who, who was being tried is Dr. Karl Brandt, who was Hitler's personal physician and also uh, played a, a substantial role in policy. And his defense was introducing all of these books published by Scribner and all of these treatises written by American academics from America's finest universities. And he's, you know, he said, well, you know, we were just doing what you were doing. You know, another way of saying it, you know, we are all familiar with that horrible uh, self-exculpatory phrase, I was just following orders. Right. But in this case, it was, I was just following Americans. Well, that's a powerful uh, indictment. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't 
need inspiration to follow, but they could use that as an excuse, I guess. As an excuse, yeah. Um, so when you started the book, Dan, in 2014, um, were you planning to do it as a Jewish story? Because when you finally published it, the world around had come so far and uh, so, 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 so strongly that it became a much more universal story. But which one was the original? Uh, well, no, it, was, it, it had nothing to do with today's, what's happening today. My research had nothing to do with what's happening today. And though when I was writing, I was certainly aware of what was happening. Uh, it does, as you know, you've read the book. Nowhere do I mention the current movement. And in fact, speaking of irony, I conclude the book, the body of the book, before the epilogue, um, with a scene in 1965 when Lyndon Johnson is on Liberty Island and he's looking up at the Statue of Liberty and he signs the Hart Cellar Bill, which revokes the 1924 Act, ends the quotas. And, and he says that, you know, now we can finally fulfill the promise made by Lady Liberty standing there. And as I write, it was a beautiful, sunshiny day, and it looked like the future of American immigration would be just as bright. Now, that was written with irony implanted deep in my soul, uh, because of course we know that's not the case. Um, what we see in the current immigration debate that relates directly to the experience of the Jews and the Italians, and I think we as Jews must, must, must remember this. It's not making decisions on who could come into the country based on whether that person is a decent person, a smart person, a hardworking person, or a thief, or a liar, or whatever. When you're basing it on racial or national categories, it's despicable. And just as the Jews and the Italians and the Greeks and many others were singled out in the 1924 law, we now see Mexicans, Central Americans, people who live in Muslim countries, not individuals, not, should I let this man from Cairo into the country? Well, you know, he's okay, but he's not okay, whatever. No, you're all no good. And, uh, I think that it's incumbent upon us, whether we think that immigration in principle is a good thing or not, just to make certain that our immigration laws are not aimed ethnically or religiously. That, that is a very important and, and clear um, analogy between how it was couched, not only couched, how it was phrased then and how it is put forth now, because there's always a veneer of it being um, economically driven about losing jobs. And that was a, 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 one of the tones that was done in the, in the early 1900s about uh, they're not only gonna breed us out of being a white race, but they're also gonna take our jobs away. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons why among the leading opponents of immigration was Samuel Gompers, himself a Jewish immigrant from right. England, as the head of the AFL. Uh, he didn't want cheaper workers coming in. And in fact, it's not entirely wrong. Uh, I mean, not the facts aren't entirely wrong. That bringing in unskilled labor from, uh, from overseas will either take, it, it will take jobs if these people are willing to work for less money than Americans are willing to work for. And, and people born in America, I have to watch my language, uh, are, are willing to work for. Uh, it does have an economic impact. So if you want to say, let's limit the number of immigrants, Right. You know, the, the, the uh, law in 1965, the figure was, I think, 560,000, a lot more than the 160,000 in the 1924 law. But if you want to limit the number? Okay, just don't limit them based on their religion or their ethnicity. It's amazing when you say 1965, after the devastation that took place in World War II and everything that had happened, we still, in this country, this country didn't open its doors. There were people who had to wait for many uh, periods of time, a long time to get in. Right, there were two, there were, you know, there, there really were, I think, two reasons why the 1965 law came to be. One good reason and not one slightly less good reason. The good reason was it was a time of ferment about civil rights. You know, at the same time that we are looking at uh, African Americans and, and, and seeking to grant them full citizenship in the country that they were born in, uh, it raises the question about, well, where do we all come from? I mean, we're all this mixed, many ethnicities. And we, how, can, how can we separate people on the basis of ethnicity? 
But the second uh, and kind of unexpected reason, as people your age and mine will remember, during the 1950s, Eastern Europe, particularly, those were the captive nations. They were under the thumb of Soviet communism. So the people who lived in Poland and Russia and Czechoslovakia and Hungary, and Hungary they were apotheosized by American politicians. These are imprisoned heroes who need to come to this country. And that helped knock down a few bricks of the wall as well. Well, it, there, there's another book I think you must have out there about what it must have felt like when um, in that period in the early 1900s after the Civil War, uh, you had all of these organizations trying to protect America to be a white society when inside you had such a large number of people who had just supposedly been liberated from slavery yet were not able to even within the country become yeah though well, you know that leads to you know some some other surprising i suppose people who support who were anti-immigrant at various times one of them is i think one of the greatest heroes in american history frederick Douglass. but as he saw the freed slaves seeking a way to make a living he feared it was particularly Chinese laborers that he was thinking of, but any cheaper immigrant labor that came into the country would make it harder for the freed blacks to find a way to economic security. Yeah. Uh, so it, 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 it crops up in unlikely and unpleasant places. It, it, there, there's many, uh, many lines uh, that are drawn here and the economics do carry over. But what struck me about the book was how, how much it legitimized and normalized concepts of racism that today, even though we would be revolted by them, they still seem to still have long and deep roots. It's a terrible thing, and I'm not the scholar of psychology who could explain it, but it does seem that we as a species always seem to need to find another group to look down on. Mm -hmm. That however low we are in some ranking, and I'm not talking about Jews specifically here, just humans. There's got to be somebody below us to look down on. And once you begin to make that kind of a hierarchical decision about groups of people, uh, you have given the lie to any pretense toward decent democratic thought that uh, you think you have. Well, on that note, Dan, I think uh, we will, uh, we will uh, bring our conversation to a close of this chapter. Um, let me thank you uh, for joining us today to talk about The Guarded Gate. As I told you, I thought it was one of the great books that I've read in quite a while, and it is not only a great read, but I want to tell our, our viewing audience that it is a, as they come here now, so relevant to so many of the key issues of our time. Um, obviously for the museum, it is uh, right in our wheelhouse about what we talk about in terms of fighting hate, discrimination, and racism. And the museum sits facing the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. So when I first heard about and then read the book, I, I thought that we, if we would have had the chance, could have co-published it with you. But of course, I don't know if I would have chosen Scribner's as the house that would do it. But I want to thank you, Dan, for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. Us, this, this most important work, and I want to recommend to anybody who can to uh, buy the book on, uh, either online or at your store. It's The Guarded Gate uh, by Daniel Okrent. And Dan, I, uh, I hope that you'll be able to join us again. I see some hands waving out there for questions. I, I'm, first, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jack, for giving me this opportunity to talk about something that I obviously feel is very, very important uh, for Americans to know. Very well done, Dan. And now I'm going to hand it back to Samantha Shokin, who will field some questions from our viewers. Thanks again. Sure. Thank you, Dan. Jack, uh, that was great. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in and only 15 minutes. Uh, so so I'll, I'll do my best, okay? Um, this first question comes from Vicky. It's a comment and a question. Uh, Vicky wants to address the issue of resistance to and protest of eugenics among average citizens. So was there any sort of grassroots movement in opposition to eugenics? Uh, shockingly, no. Uh, certainly not grassroots. Um, the, there were some very important academic figures 
who stood there and said, no, we can't have this. The leading one of those was Franz Boas, himself a German Jewish immigrant. Uh, he's really the father of American anthropology. And he was valiant and he was insistent and he was ignored. Um, why was there no mass movement? Well, I think partly because the labor movement was anti-immigrant. So those people who would get involved in movements for, you know, to, to help the downtrodden, uh, you know, they, they, they weren't going to become part of it. The ethnic groups that were already, the members of the ethnic groups who were being discriminated against who were already here, the Italians had no political power at all. The G German Jews did have some political power and they did make some effort. Um, but on a broad base, uh, you gen you know, the, a scientific concept is hard to explain and it's even harder to refute uh, to a lay audience. And I think that may have had something to do with it as well. And if I can add, there was some pushback from the scientific community against uh, um, I, I, some of the publications and some of the... Yeah, yeah, and, and definitely. And Boas was the leading, leading uh, member of that group. Herbert Jennings, another uh, uh, esteemed geneticist from um, uh, Johns Hopkins. There, there were several from the scientific community. But uh, as Vicki asked, th did it become a popular movement? No, not at all. Right. Thank you. Um, so what our viewer Eric finds interesting is that America is a nation built on immigration. So where did these scientists trace their lineage? Did they think that their lineage was the only acceptable one? Uh, the answer to the second part of that is yes, uh, fundamentally, or similar lineage, just Nordic. They were cool with people who were from the British Isles and Scandinavian countries and Northern Germany. That was basically it. Uh, anybody else was dubious, but, but, but interestingly, the term, this isn't the scientist necessarily, but the, the Boston and New York aristocrats who financed the movement, who led the anti-immigration movement, the term they used to define themselves, their ethnicity, they called themselves Native Americans. <laughs> and it's really hilarious given you know, the context today, what, what that means. They considered themselves Native Americans because their family got here early, because they got it here in the 17th century but they were willing to accept people who came in the 18th or 19th century if they were coming from the British Isles. Thank you for breaking that down. Um, we had a couple of people ask about Margaret Sanger's role in embracing eugenics. Uh, did she have yeah. any racist motives? Um, Margaret Sanger is an interesting case. Uh, she, well, she was half Jewish herself. That's some kind of a qualifier, I suppose. Uh, what, what I think is the case with, with, with Sanger is that she would support anybody who supported her. She was so ardent in her, uh, her advocacy for birth control, uh, the availability of birth control, and for Planned Parenthood, a, a term that she coined, that if she could find somebody who would support that, she would then go support them. So in fact, Madison Grant, among others, it was part and parcel of the eugenic movement to be controlling birth. Who marries whom? Who gets to have children? Where do our children come from? So there was an affinity and she allowed herself to be used by those people, but willingly used. I don't think we can, you know, can excuse her entirely, but it was, I think, her ardency, uh, her single-mindedness blinded her to the consequences of her genuinely racist, ethnicist, thought. And as late as her autobiography in 1938, she is still endorsing the idea of eugenics. Yeah, no, that's that's a, a point that was in the book. There, there was no uh, ambivalence there. She was a very yeah. strong voice yeah. for eugenics. Yeah, I don't think hers was necessarily race or religion based, but she was definitely a eugenicist. She wanted to limit reproduction. It was, it was real yeah. politics, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Right. Um, here's a question from Mark. Uh, Mark asks, how, how, Dan, do you compare the eugenics-based immigration exclusion of Jews and Italians to the Chinese and Asian exclusionary acts? Well, they're very, very similar. And, 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 and as I alluded to uh, earlier, uh, the, the difference with the 1924 Act to separate from the Asian Exclusionary Act, it was the first time that any limitation had been put on immigration from Europe where most Americans had come from, uh, where most people were considered, to use the term, white. Um, but this was 
really the idea behind Madison Grant's diabolical uh, uh, division um, uh, of the races is that he was trying to make Jews and Italians not white. In fact, there's a really interesting court case from Alabama from this period about a black man marries a white woman in what is perceived to be violation, uh, he marries a woman from Sicily in what is perceived to be violation of the of the anti-miscegenation laws that were in effect in Alabama at the time. But in fact, on appeal, he was acquitted because the judge found, how do we know that somebody from Sicily is white? Mm. So. Very interesting. And, and it's interesting to compare to today. Uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, I Italians and Ashkenazi Jews not thinking of themselves as white in this country. Um, he here's a question from, Jeffrey, to what extent does fear of, quote, non-assimilation and a change in the national culture play a role in racial eugenics in America? Well, this, this comes up over and over again, from Benjamin Franklin forward. It's the fear that there's something about our culture that is going to be altered and corrupted by this invasion from abroad. Uh, now, altered? Probably. Um, I think that there, you know, think of Tin Pan Alley music wouldn't exist without the Eastern European Jews who wrote it. Uh, the, there are any number of ways that the incursion of people from abroad alters American life. Corrupt is a very different term, obviously, and the, the very notion of corrupting a culture because you come from a different culture is, I think, the, the questioner would agree that that's kind of, a, kind of ugly. Thank you. Um, here's a question, kind of a philosophical question from Carol. Uh, do you think our prestigious scientific research institutions need to also make better known their involvement in the eugenics movement? Because there are so many opportunities for science to be misused. Yes, and, and I do think so. And this is something that is happening now. Uh, <clears throat> David Starr Jordan, a leading eugenicist, was the founding president of Stanford University. And there's a re-examination of his role in the university's creation. Of course, buildings named after him. Same thing that happened. You know, Woodrow Wilson, of course, was very pro-immigration, so he doesn't fit into this into this part of this the story. Um, I and some other uh, people who study eugenics are trying to persuade the American Museum of Natural History to have a conference in September of 2021 on the 100th anniversary of a very important conference there that actually kind of crowned eugenic scientific racism that term was was validated and valorized at the american museum of natural history 99 years ago and we hope we can persuade them to do something about it it's important for institutions and individuals to be honest about their past that doesn't mean we need to punish them for them but they need to be honest you know you know something uh, if i can just say something uh, dan sure uh, that reminds me that there was a lot of uh, um social Darwinism, and Darwin was held up very often times within the movement as an example of someone whose beliefs and his, his scientific uh, evidence had been used as inspiration. Uh, right, and you know, it, it's an interesting perversion of Darwinism. If you stop to think about it, until Darwin, the overwhelming view was that we were all derived from Adam and Eve. It was the biblical story of, of creation. If we are all from the same parents, then we were all brothers and sisters, and there's no difference between us. Darwin established that we were not all from the same parents, that evolution, human evolution, happens in different ways all over the globe. Uh, when he, uh, you know, he makes this clear in, in, in the second book he writes about, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, Origin of Species, uh, he, he is fundamentally saying that if there are, there are differences, and if there are differences, then somebody else is going to say, is going to rank them. Somebody's better than somebody else. But we're, it is a Darwinian, the, the root of, the, the, of this thinking is in Darwin. It's just, it's, it, it's distorted and, and it's a perverted in an unfair way. Perverted, yeah. Um, I have a question of my own, actually. Um, I, forgive me, I haven't read the book yet, but I am curious to know, if in a few words, uh, can you explain how eugenics went from being sort of an established progressive idea at the turn of the 20th century to something that is today decidedly backward and wrongheaded by you know, our progressive ideology today? Was there a distinct turning point in history or was it more of a gradual? Yeah, it was called Hitler. 
I mean, I think it's as simple as that. That, that I mean, there were other reasons. There were other people who moved away from it before then. But the, the, the weaponization of racial eugenics by the most evil creature of the 20th century, um, that changed a lot of people's minds. I would also suggest, Dan, that our country did have this history of racism even before the uh, immigration debate. And it was our own version of, of people coming here as by choice or people coming here as slaves. Absolutely. And that I believe there's some direct connection between how the society developed after the Civil War and after we went through that and then emerged this uh, concept of racism and eugenics and then the turn towards fighting immigration. I think you're absolutely right. Um, for sure. I thank you both, Dan and Jack. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, although this conversation could go on and on. Uh, it's really fascinating, and I'm inspired, as I'm sure so many others watching today are, to buy the book and read it. Um, the book, uh, The Guarded Gate, is out now. It's available in bookstores everywhere and, all, and on all digital booksellers. Um, I, I included a link in the chat, but don't worry if you missed it. I will email all of today's registrants with a link where you could purchase the book and also a link to the YouTube video of today's program. It was recorded, so don't worry if you missed a part of it or if your friends missed out. Um, I'll be sending out a follow-up email in the coming days. So thank you again, Dan and Jack. This was really fantastic. Thank you for inviting me. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Samantha, for doing such a good job. I meant that both as the interviewer and as someone who has the position at the museum. And thank, thank you, Jack. <laughs> thank you, Dan. It was a pleasure. All right, guys, signing off. So long. Take care.